feel like everyone's sitting. Okay. We like so, here. <laughs> I think <laughs> they're here. So welcome everybody. Welcome to Politics and Prose Live. My name is Hannah and I'm a bookseller here at the Children and Teens Department. Thank you all for joining us. I am so excited today to have our author Stuart Gibbs and Sarah Melissa. Oh my goodness, I forgot to ask you beforehand and it meant to. I will try my best and then she will correct me. <laughs> Molaski is my best jazz. And the correction is. Oh, there's really no right way to say it. So don't worry. As long okay. as you make a good effort to get all the letters in, I'm good. Okay, great. Okay. Well, they have both joined us today. And before I fully introduce them, I just want to go over a couple of rules before we get into this thing. Um, at any time during this event, you can click on the link below. It'll be in the chat and you can get your own copy of Spy School, Spy School Revolution. Also, other things to know is that there'll be other books in there too. So if you missed anything in the series, you can always go in there and just click on it and get whatever you need. Also, as you know, we're always trying to make sure that we're able to facilitate their conversation the best way possible. So in that way, we want to be able to have questions and we want to have them answered. And when we're doing that, please remember that when you put something in the Q&A, just make sure it's a really honest question that you have about the book, about what these authors are talking about, anything in the event. Um, so just try to keep it focused. Awesome. Next up is the introductions. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Stuart Gibbs. And he is going to be in conversation, as we know, with Sarah, and we're going to try it again, Malawski. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart has written many best-selling series. His current ongoing series are Fun Jungle, the Charlie Thorne series, and the series that we're going to be talking about today, whoop, hello, Spy School, and this one is Spy School Revolution. He has also been a um, screenwriter, and he has developed TV shows for Disney and Nickelodeon and others. Sarah is also a best-selling author and from her series, Whatever After series. She has written books spanning from elementary to adult. She is the founder of OMG Book Fest, which brings excitement and book engagement to underserved communities in Illinois, Ohio, Missouri, and Colorado. And now I'm going to turn the conversation over to them. So Stuart and Sarah, Yay. have fun. Hi. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. I do. I'm so excited. Um, Stu is one of my good friends. So I'm very excited to get to interview him today about lots of different stuff. Um, I'm going to ask him questions about uh, being a kid, as a being a writer, about this series specifically. And then I'll have a little lightning round of questions if we can get through all that. Okay. First of all, hi, Stu. How are you? Hello, Sarah. Hi. I hold it up. Uh, uh, you know, um, it would be nice if we could both be at Politics and Prose together. That's that, what I would like to say. Yes, that would be really fun. Um, maybe next year we could maybe, do that. Maybe that, I would love for that. Yeah. That would be fun. Yes. So. Okay. I want you to start by telling me, telling us a little bit about the series, about Spy School series. Could you give us a little introduction for anyone who is not familiar with it? For the, for the three people left on earth who don't know Spy School. All right. Uh, it is a, a series about uh, a young uh, kid named Ben Ripley who gets recruited to the CIA's top secret academy of espionage, which may be located really, really close to where politics and prose is. Uh, it is it is located <laughs> in sort of northwestern Washington, D.C. And um, Ben thinks, oh, cool, they're going to turn me into one of those super cool movie spies like James Bond or Ethan Hunt from Mission Impossible. And it turns out that the reality is it's very hard to be a spy like one of those guys. And he gets wrapped up in all sorts of spy missions, all sorts of danger and intrigue and double crossing. Uh, it ends in way over his head, but manages to sort of persevere. And with the help of several uh, friends who are also in the spy school, he manages to save the day in what are now eight books in the spy school series. Eight books, amazing. Okay, so what about this specific book? Can you tell us a little bit about what this one is about? This specific book right here, Spy School Revolution. Oh, look at that. Um, I just finished it this morning. It's oh, you did? Wow. Um, <laughs> oh, good. Um, so so this is the eighth book, and, and I feel like by the time came to eighth book, I maybe, maybe needed to shake things up a bit, introduce some new bad guys. So um, it, it actually does tie into the Washington DC area uh, because I, I was doing school visits uh, in the in the DC suburbs in Virginia 
and happened to be right by Mount Vernon, which is uh, sort of uh, famously the, uh, was the home of, of uh, George Washington. Uh, and uh, while I was visiting Mount Vernon, uh, they told me that George Washington had been the first spy master of the United States, which was news to me. I was very surprised that I hadn't ever realized that in addition to being president and commander of the armed forces, he had also been our first spy master. And so with their help, uh, and, and some books they pointed me towards, I did all this research into what Washington's spy ring was like. And it turns out that Washington had this really impressive spy ring that used secret codes and invisible inks and dead drops and all this stuff that we still have our spies use today. And I just got really sort of obsessed with the idea that uh, maybe it would be fun to have a spy school adventure that tied into something that Washington had discovered. And so that meant I needed a, uh, a, a, a new group of bad guys who had actually been around since Washington's time or even before Washington's time. So, uh, so I, that was sort of the impetus. And if you do read the book and you, you have been in Washington or live in Washington quite, uh, I, I use a lot of landmarks in the Washington DC area in this book because uh, Washington is the most fun place to do research ever because everything is free and you can just wander around on the National Mall and be like, oh, I'm going to go see a moon lander. Now I'm going to go across the mall and go see some impressionist paintings. And now I'm going to go see a dinosaur skeleton. And you can do all that and not spend any money at all. That sounds great and fun. We'll do it when we're when we're, um, when we're there. Rose. Yeah, next time. Okay, I want to hear a little bit about what you were like when you were younger. So what was elementary school do like? <laughs> I was, I was going well, loud. Uh, oddly, not, 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 no, not loud at all. I was writing all the time. In, in fact, I, 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 I it, it's going to sound like I'm just pandering to the people there, but I, I actually spent two years of my life in the Washington, D.C. area at school. Uh, I went to Garrett Park Elementary, which is just sort of uh, out by Bethesda. And uh, while I was at Garrett Park, I was writing all the time, and I might have possibly written a book ah. called The Day the Dinosaurs Came Back. I, 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 was, I was not just a new writer, I was also new at cover design. And uh, <laughs> what was really cool about Very this book tiny. <laughs> was, the, yes, I know, it's, it's wrapping paper. Uh, and it was, it was put in the Garrett Park School Library. Uh, and so there it is right there. Oh, that and, amazing. Uh, my friends could check it out and and I uh, see you can see like this is a library card children don't have library cards anymore but <laughs> but but this can was we very hear, like a line or two of it can we hear like a can little I... bit is there anything where like yeah yeah first of all I'll point out look at that arc there that, that is in, you have a second fun. career as a graphic novelist right <laughs> <That's, there. laughs> but somebody did type it for me I suspect it was one of my teachers or possibly my um yeah I was like uh once upon a time there was a nice quiet little town but one day, 10 dinosaurs came out of the woods. <laughs> uh, the people tried to get them out of the town, but they would not go. In a few days, the town was all wrecked up. That's <laughs> <laughs> there. There. There nice to find illustrations there. So. Awesome. Maybe that'll come out next year. Yeah. Um, so but what were you also like as a kid? Were you like so... I, I, what were you I, uh, well, this would be surprising people who know if I wanted to go to the zoo every day, uh, the, the National Zoo, uh, sort of uh, famously uh, free, uh, so you can go whenever you want, um, and uh, and actually at any time of day you want, pretty much as long as it's light out, you can get in the National Zoo. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I like animals and I like writing and oh. and i like soccer so those were sort of the three things i would i would have been doing as a kid i don't know what were you because i know you were writing as a kid too I, I was writing as a as a kid too i even pulled a book Where did you? the funny part gate okay, this is one of the books that i wrote it's not fairy tale related but my right. favorite part about it is the about the author <laughs> oh you didn't wait did you see now you okay your your uh graphic design far let's just wait i'm gonna put mine up again and then you put yours up again look at that that is that is uh, far better than, right? yes. I even have a copyright page. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I didn't copyright mine. I'm, uh oh, you know what? This is, Michael Crichton stole my idea for, for Jurassic Park oh, yeah. because I didn't, I didn't put a copyright in. I, I didn't oh. want to say it, but all oh. that's what happened. Oh man, Crichton, oh jeez. 
Wait, what did you like to read as a kid? What was your favorite book? Oh, I, I happen to have that right here. Oh. Uh, yes, the, I, the, in the book, uh -huh. the Westing Game by Ellen Raskin, a uh, uh, fantastic mystery. Uh, also, uh, I was a very big fan of uh, the Encyclopedia Brown series, okay. uh, which uh, I think, like, there's a kind of direct line from Encyclopedia Brown to my heroes yeah. and Sally Kimball to all the girls in my book because because Encyclopedia was a, was a boy who was really smart and everybody respected him for being smart and Sally Kimball was the toughest girl in town and everybody respected her for that and uh, nobody yeah. thought they were weird or anything for being smart or tough and uh, so that was cool. I don't know what was your favorite book as a kid? Um, I read a lot of Babysitter's Clubs books okay. and I read a lot of also mysteries and scary stuff so th those I never try to write now like I read a lot of Lois Duncan Christopher Pike Arl Stein I really like thriller and I've always wanted at some point to write thrillers but all my stuff is more Judy Bloom. oh and Gordon Corman obviously a mutual friend of both of us yeah I uh, read I mean uh, Gordon and I both grew up in Canada so he was like the Canadian writer and he wrote his first book at 12. yeah um, yeah, yeah, we don't like that about Gordon. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I know the difference is, see, Gordon, Gordon didn't just get it. Like his got published. He didn't just stick yeah. it in the school library. He just, right, so. This can't be happening in McDonald's Hall for anyone interested. It's his first book and he wrote it when he was 12 years old. Um, okay, so who was your favorite spy as a kid? Like, oh, that was, that was, you know, I think it was limited actually because like there was really James Bond. James Bond was, yeah. was just the guy uh, I saw Moonraker when I was a kid. That was my first James Bond movie, which in retrospect is one of the worst James Bond movies they ever made. But when I was a kid, it was the only one we could see. And we were like, wow, James, he's got these cool gadgets. And he, he went to space in Moonraker, which is ridiculous. Um, I mean, I think now because kids are like, oh, they could see the Mission Impossible series or the Jason Bourne series, uh, the, you know, uh, if their parents let them. Uh, there, there are sort of more spies to pick from but but i uh and, and i would say like i actually like once uh, vcrs came out and you could see uh the movies i i went through all the james bond movies and then i read the books and that was where i discovered the the really kind of unsettling discovery that often the book and the movie were nothing like each other i didn't know Very that could be the case. <laughs> right yes yes i know have you ever had a book become a movie that's not quite I have actually. Well, um, Upside Down Magic was just uh, was just premiered on the Disney. Just turn around. Just look. look oh, yeah. Just look, there, there it is on Disney <laughs> Channel. Yes. So. Upside Down Magic is on the Disney Channel right now, and it's it's adorable, but it is it definitely is. very different from the books. Uh, yes. So they took like little things, like um, in well, not little things, but in our in our book series, it's set at public school. Uh, Nori and her friends basically don't get into the fancy magic school and end up at Dunmiddle, which is a public magic school instead. And they end up being put inside a class of, for kids with upside down magic, which means magic that work that works a little bit differently than everybody else's. And the movie instead, decide, uh, they based it at the fancy private school. So that was one big difference. And there's a lot of other things, but um, what, I, what I did love about the movie is that Nori, the main character, is exactly how we imagined her, and the heart of the movie is very the same. But yeah, the uh, same. They, they do make changes. And they kept it, because that was the thing I found out with, with James Bond books, was sometimes the only thing the movie had in common with the book at all was the title, and that James <laughs> Bond was in it. And there was nothing else <laughs> at all that was even close to the book. And so you'd be like, wait, how can they do this? But, well, I guess, I mean, you worked in movies also, so, okay. um, and if, if you ever adapt your own stuff, like, how do you know what to keep in and what to keep different? Well, so I am, I am adapting uh, the original Spy School for Disney right now, and um, it, you know, it, I, I'm trying to stay as close as possible to the book, but <clears throat> the, um, you know, the book is, is longer than a movie could be, and so you, you have to figure out how to, like, what scenes to cut and it, that's really hard to figure out or, or how to combine maybe one or two scenes. Uh, so maybe you're, you're having dialogue during an action sequence instead of two different sequences. Um, so it, it's, it's rough, but, but I, I think I've managed to, one of the fun things though is, is if the movie does actually come out uh, is that I could make a bigger action sequence at the end than I could in the book. And so that was kind of uh, fun to do. So, you know, maybe, Maybe that'll happen at ready. I always have to, you know, temper this by telling people just because the movie industry has bought or the rights to something does not mean that the movie will come out.
Yes, that's very true. I do find your books very cinematic, though. Um, like they practically read like a movie in a way that I think mine don't necessarily. In my books, I have so much internal stuff. Um, because your background is movies, I, it, it comes through. You can I can see the whole book. I, I think I think that's right. It, it is that I wrote movies. I, I you know I, obviously I started writing books when I was a kid, but then I was able to get work as a screenwriter before I could ever publish a book. And so I think that uh, right when you write movies, you're always thinking very visually. So when I came time to, came time to write the book, I was I was very writing very visually as well. But I also find that Ben's voice, I think what makes the Spy School book so successful is Ben's voice. It's because it's funny, it's relatable. Um, I'm wondering like, does this voice come very natural to you or, or, when, or when you're writing your different series, like how do you change them a little bit for each main character? Um, yeah, well, Ben is actually supposed to be kind of like a very relatable person to to the reader. So even if if you you're not a young, 12 year old boy, Ben is often uh, voicing the things that I thought some any normal person would would voice. Like the, the, sort of the joke to me of spy school was that you could take the most competent person you know and drop them into a James Bond movie and they would screw it up. You did not have to be an idiot to screw up a James Bond action sequence. And so Ben just sort of keeps finding himself in these ridiculous situations like, uh, you know, where you know, Erica, who's his fellow spy, will hand him a grappling hook and say, well, you know how to use this, don't you? And Ben's response is, nobody knows how to use a grappling hook. This is not like normal day-to-day -day stuff. And um, so he's, he's really, uh, he, he's maybe a little over cynical for somebody who's 12, but, but uh, I, I, I wanted him to sort of be, uh, aware enough of what the hype of James Bond movies or Mission Impossible movies was, and then sort of confronting the reality of what spying uh, might actually be like. So, so, um, so that's sort of his take, um, you know, um, uh, like Teddy in Fun Jungle is a little, uh, he's, he's not quite as cynical as, as, uh, as Ben, he's uh, Teddy has this wealth of knowledge about the animal world that he he brings to that story, and so he's sort of enthusiastic about sharing what he knows about animals and 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 how excited he is to be at Fun Jungle and those sorts of things. I think come through a little bit more in him. Okay. Um, and speaking of all these amazing things that Ben learns over the course of the series. I'm wondering about research for those specific things, like jumping out of helicopters, and and like, how do you ha, have you tested any of these things out? Do you just I, I've jumped out. I've not jumped out of a helicopter. <laughs> that one um, is right, and then that sort of the thing is like you, you know. I, I mean, all I know is that I would be terrified to jump out of a helicopter. So therefore, Ben is terrified to right. jump out of a helicopter too. That's what I think most people. Would you be terrified to jump out of a helicopter? Yes, I would. I would. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is a parachute, but still, that doesn't, you know, parachuting, <laughs> all very scary. Um, Do you ever yeah, read something, uh, like, specifically physical that your characters have done in the book? Have I? Um, like, I mean, even, like, the, the dart. Let's see, like, have you ever tried anything? <laughs> is there anything? Is the nation? I don't, uh, no, I, gosh, if, you know, uh, like, every once in a while, uh, I haven't done this in a while, but I would, just like say like, oh, like I wonder how fast it would be, like how fast you could run from one place to another. And you know, what's funny is like what never happens in, in, in action, you never see anybody getting winded, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but they do, right? Like, <clears throat> you know, kids don't get winded maybe as fast as adults do, but it is kind of interesting to say like, oh, I'm gonna run at top speed for like three blocks. And then you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Like that's really tiring, and yet nobody ever has that happen in a, in an action movie that you never see. Yeah. James Bond is running in like a suit with like he's not wearing nice shoes to run in. He's wearing like the worst possible shoes to run. In, you know, they also never have to pee. So. They never have to pee. No, <laughs> no, that comes up in the very first uh, uh, one. Yes, right in the first in in the middle of Ben's first action sequence. He's like, I have to go to the bathroom. And Erica's like, why didn't you go to the bathroom before the action sequence, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> well, I know you did a lot of research, other research, actual physical reading and stuff with the, or exploring places for this book. And I'm wondering, when you do research, are you already in the middle of the scene and then you go and then you kind of tweak it back or do you do the research before so that it informs the scene? You know, there's a little back and forth. Um, it definitely the, the final sequence 
in um, uh, in in Spy School Revolution was inspired by me visiting the place where it happens and thinking, <clears throat> like, wow, that would be a great place for an action sequence. And, and we're not going to say where that is yet. But um, uh, then, though, other parts, like, say, uh, um, you know, the, the whole book was inspired uh, by me uh, being at, at uh, um, by Mount Vernon in in the Virginia suburbs and and uh, thinking I should go visit it and then getting an invitation from somebody at Mount Vernon at the exact same time to drop by who realized I was out there uh, doing school visits and then going to Mount Vernon and discovering that that George Washington had been our original spy master and uh, that then inspired a whole lot of um, uh, that, that, that was sort of the impetus for that whole book. So some, and, and then there's, uh, there's another sequence at, at another location in, uh, out in the Virginia suburbs, uh, I'll, I'll, I can say, it, 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 at the Great Falls of Potomac, which I had been to like 20 years ago, thought it would be a good place for an action sequence, and then got the chance to go back and visit it again after I'd written the book to just make sure the sequence would work. And it, it kind of did, so. <laughs> Can we talk about the the uh, Croatoan? Yes. Um, okay. And I'm wondering, like, how you decided. I don't want. I don't want to give any spoilers. Oh, right, but, right. How, like, did you always know you were going to be introducing a new evil crew? And I thought that. Um, so, so in the Spy School books, mostly the books had been dealing with a, with an evil organization called Spider, and I thought that at a certain point, it was just going to see uh, like he either had to defeat Spider or something had to happen. Like he couldn't just fight Spider in every single book. So uh, I came up with a way to sort of end uh, Spider or, you know, or at least defeat them temporarily in uh, Spy School British Invasion. And then, uh, then I needed a new uh, bad guy. And so I, I was playing around with this idea that uh, wouldn't it be neat to uh, have <clears throat> Ben and his uh, fellow spies need to uncover something that uh, George Washington had uncovered and that then meant well George it would have to be an evil organization that had existed all the way back during colonial times and very clever <laughs> oh thank you thank you so I so I came up with the, the so the Croatoan which ties into a little bit of American history um the, the Jamestown settlement uh I don't know if you would have learned about this at school in in Canada <laughs> we did not <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no you didn't have uh, 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 so, right, because some, you know, we get into American Revolution history and you start bumping into Canada. We were, we were doing, there, there was all sorts of, you know, stuff well, that Canadians going on there. I learned that much about the American Revolution, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so Jamestown is this famous, uh, it was the first settlement in America and uh, um, it, it disappeared. I mean, nobody knows what happened to it. And all that happened was that they found the word Croatoan carved into a tree nearby that's that's it that's the only clue he had and so I thought like oh wouldn't that be interesting if that was like something that originally happened uh due to this this organization and then you know that was their first strike against America and then when you were just like oh I need to come up with a, with new bad guys and then so you started to go back did you have the idea for them from the beginning I, I just thought like I need I need new bad guys and then I thought oh they should be uh okay. have, existed back in Washington's time and maybe went even farther back. And I, I, I think it was probably like, you know, my, my daughter was maybe in fourth grade and they had, the, they were doing Jamestown, something like that, maybe fifth grade, probably fifth grade. And, and so I was like, Oh, Croto. And yes, that's, that's uh, uh, right. They got rid of the Jamestown settlement and then they, they went from there causing all sorts of trouble. Um, okay. I have to ask a little bit about the romance in the book because I feel like people are really, you know, <laughs> Curious, is it going to be, uh, who is it going to be? Is it going to be Bowie? Is it going to be Bannikan? I think you almost introduced a potential new love interest, maybe, or is that just me? I, yeah. I, well, um, you know, you would not be alone with my <laughs> uh, with my fans. There have been a lot of, there's already some sort of uh, stuff going on online. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a bit of a twist involving uh, a new character coming into the book, right. which I didn't really think of so much as romance, is just really coming in to sort of complicate things farther for, for because like in the series, um, you know, it's to me, I've been talking a lot about the plot and bad guys, but I think a lot of what is driving me forward in the series is, is the complications of the friendships and the romances and how those impact the, uh, 
the missions and which is another thing you never see in James Bond James, or, or any like, but I thought, you know, if you're on a mission with a girl you have a crush on, uh, does that screw up your mission? And <laughs> in, in, in truth, it probably would, yes. Probably not. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I have one more question then I'm gonna do a quick lightning round. Okay. So, as you know, I'm obsessed with crossovers. And nope. when, I read, <laughs> when I read this book, I couldn't help, this isn't a spoiler because it's in like the first chapter. Right. Uh, uh, Ben's parents are introduced and there's talk about him going, them going into witness protection. Right. Um, and I couldn't help wonder if maybe they could be going into fun jungle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> protection. Um, and I, I bet you have fans who would love to see that happen too. I, I, they probably would. No, I get, yeah. yes, I get a lot of requests for a crossover and I haven't, like, I, I'm not against it. It is, it is just hitting upon that area that it, like or on that idea that says like yes this i have to do a crossover for this uh and i i haven't you know it's not like i'm not i mean i might be planting some seeds out there at some point but i i uh so i'm, <laughs> I'm never saying no to the crossover i'm just saying but i but i will tell fans that one of the reasons one of the nice things about doing series is that you get to take a break from one series multiple series you, you take a break from one series I, I take a break from spy school to go do fun jungle or charlie thorne and if i um if i combine two then i didn't get a break from either one of them and and so that's i don't know would you you haven't done a crossover have you i have not done a crossover but it doesn't work as well for me because there's such different universes i mm -hmm. couldn't well, whatever oh, I fall into different books. <laughs> Maybe I'll have Abby fall into uh, Spy School. You can have it right. We can do a crossover series like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, right. If right. you can mess up the mission. She in will totally. Right. She'll totally be great. I'm not sure how she'd feel about Erica, though. I think she'd like Ben, but I think Erica, she'd, she'd find Erica very tough. And they would she would. Well, no, I, right. Erica's not the easiest person to, you know. <laughs> if, if you if I was hanging out with Erica, I think she might be a little. I rough. think she'd like Zoe, but to be like. You yeah. think like Abby would kind of like maybe look up to her maybe a little bit and be... yeah, you know that's true. She does like she does like a strong female character. So there you go. You're absolutely... <laughs> okay. I'm gonna do a lightning round. Okay, right? lightning round. All right. So quick, whatever you think of, you can say right. best Halloween costume ever. Oh, sure. <laughs> yes. For me, my yeah. personal. But, Your personal best uh, Halloween costume. I, I I I love going as Indiana Jones. Man, you put on my leather jacket, my fedora, my bullwhip. I'm good to go. Okay. <laughs> Favorite Halloween snack. Yeah. Ooh, boy. Uh, I uh, I do like Kit Kats a lot. Those go very quickly when we get the Kit Kat. <laughs> Book would be surprised to see on your bookshelf. I have a. Uh, I've, I've got uh, I've got a lot of Sarah Mlinowski books on my bookshelf. <laughs> That's not surprising. Know, that, 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 that okay, no, I know maybe people would find. Uh, I got I have um, I have a lot of science books on my shelves. Maybe that's not super surprising, but uh, that's not that surprising. Okay, no, good. Not surprising. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, favorite dance move. Oh <laughs> man! I won't make you do it. <laughs> I'm like. Yeah. Uh, really, you know, uh, I only have one or two dance moves. I got, I got this sort of, you know, this from, from like fifth grade when they taught us how to disco and that. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Name something that you have always wanted to learn how to do. Uh, I would love to be better at speaking multiple languages. Okay, good. Bonjour. <laughs> Well, <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> Good. Okay, fill in the blank. When I was a kid, I was very afraid of blank. Uh, well, I, okay, I was very shy, so I guess I was afraid of being social. Oh, oh, okay. Actually, okay, that's it for the lightning, the lightning round. But there were there was one other thing I wanted to ask you, which mm -hmm. was what's next for Spy School? And I also noticed that you have it's the ten year anniversary coming up next year. Okay. Right. And I'm two two years from now, like 2022 okay. would be, yeah. 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 So yeah. I'm wondering, because it's been out for 10 years, if you have anything special that you have in mind for the 10-year anniversary. Um, I Well, first of all, there'll be a Spy School graphic novel coming out, which I might not get out to 2022. Uh, it, it'd be nice to have the Spy School movie come out then too. Uh, but there will be, uh, so, but it turns out nicely. So there'll be a Spy School 9 next year. There would be a Spy School 10 in the 10th year uh, around the 10th anniversary and uh you know just the other day uh, uh actually a reader wrote to me and said oh would you ever want to do like a, a spy school guide and i and i wrote to my 
uh, my editor and, and said like, hey, what about this? And they were like, oh, maybe that could work for the 10th year of spy school. So <laughs> we'll see. Fun. What do you all have right. coming up next? Awesome. I think what, that's what, all. The, yeah, that's all the questions I have. Wait, actually. I have a question. What, what do you, what's, yeah, what's yeah, going yeah. on? What's going on? You, I, you just had an upside down magic come out, and then I know there's more uh, whatever afters. Yes, uh, actually, we just announced today. There's going to be two more whatever after yeah. today. It was just, today was just announced. yeah. Today was just announced. I'm doing. Um, well, I'm working on. Uh, I think it's seven, book 17 and 18 in the series. Okay. 17. She's going to fall into 12 dancing princesses, and okay. then the 18th is actually a another high school. Character. <laughs> it's my school. It's my school. <laughs> um, no, she's doing uh, in, into Peter Pan. Oh, that, okay. and, oh, that's awesome. And I'm working on the copy edits for the next um, Upside Down Magic book, which comes out next year, I guess this summer. And the next whatever after Good as Gold, where she messes up uh, uh, um, uh, Goldilocks, but also Rumpelstiltskin. It's a two in one because oh, there was the word gold and I, I had to kind of bring in both. So it's a, the first ever two in one. Uh, whatever after, so I'm working on that. Yeah. What, what else are you working on? You didn't tell, tell us about. I, I asked about twice. Well, uh, oh. Okay. Oh right. Can I do that real quick? Wait, okay. Yeah. yeah. Charlie's Thorn of the Lost City out Beautiful. out uh, next uh, March. Uh, so new new is Charlie Thorn, and uh, we just sort of released the uh, the cover and title of Fun Jungle Seven uh, Bare Bottom, which I don't even have. Um, uh, I don't even have anything to show anybody yet, uh, but but it's it's out there online uh, now, uh, at, and that comes out in May, and then Spy School Nine, whatever that may be called, will be out around this time next year. To, uh, yeah, so three books next year. Awesome. Fantastic! A lot of books. Thank you guys so much. That sure. was a whole rundown of your past and your history and all your books <laughs> i really want to see your new or your first books again a lot of people have questions about them just there throwing that out there yes <laughs> um so the first question that i want to go through is when did you get the idea for that and what grade were you in they want to know exactly what for this, for this book yeah, yeah i really I, I feel like i did this in kindergarten at garrett park elementary and um and I, I, I do, I was, uh, as you might be able to tell from Tyrannosaurus Rex, I've always been obsessed with dinosaurs. And, and I remember there was a kid named uh, uh, Jimmy Who, who was also in class with me and he was obsessed with dinosaurs. And I think our teachers were like, you know, write some dinosaur books or something. We're like, all right, cool. <laughs> do something. Yeah. Something I noticed while you guys were talking is that the back or the front of your book and the front and the back of hers kind of yeah. match. Just throwing oh, that yeah. out there. Oh, the the glittery kind of thing, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you should have put a copyright on it because it's all of that book. Really? I know, I know. They stole my cover design too. <laughs> Everything is gone. Okay. The next thing is for both of you, they want to know what inspired you to start writing and then how did you go from that to becoming like a published writer? Those in well, well, Sarah broke through much faster <laughs> than I did. I know that. Well, I, I mean, I always loved to write, even from those you know, books that I wrote when I was back in third, fourth, fifth grade. And I always knew that's what I wanted to do. But I kind of thought that not everyone could be like Gordon and write books when you were 12. So I needed to get a real Gordon. job. <laughs> Gordon! <laughs> <laughs> so I decided I studied English lit in college and I always I, I had a column and I was always very involved in stuff and then I got decided to go into publishing I thought if I got jobs in publishing I would get to be around books all day um, and I would get to create stuff so I took courses in publishing in Toronto and I worked at an independent bookstore called Mabel's Fables which is a kids bookstore and while and then I got a job at Harlequin Romances in the marketing department and I loved it because I got to learn all about yeah publishing so I, I highly recommend if you want to be a writer, working in books is a great way to start and it pays the rent while you're trying to write your books. And I did end up writing my first book relatively quickly while I was at Harlequin. Uh, and it's, it's, called, it's called Milk Run. It's like a chick lit type romance type book. Uh, and which was published by Harlequin. <laughs> that works out. <laughs> it worked out well for me because I made, you know, I learned the business. And it really was a great way to learn the business. So I highly recommend those of you who want to be writers, if you want to have, find a day job looking into publishing or working at a bookstore is a great way to really learn the business. Right. Awesome. I wish Sarah had given me that advice when I was a kid. I, I didn't, all right. Because I, I didn't know. I, uh, right. But, but I, I actually did that because I, I, I kind of thought like, okay, well, uh, I was trying to do the, the traditional route of, of um, 
uh, getting a book published. And, and I would say that, that uh, really there was a, something called the literary marketplace, which was, it, it was in physical form when I was a kid and you would go to the library and get it and it had lists of all the, uh, all the agents in America or maybe America and Canada now that I think about it. And then you would, um, you'd have to write them all actual letters or call their offices and, and so I could find agents that way. Uh, now I'm sure it's online, actually. I know there's an online version of it, but I, so maybe you subscribe to it or maybe libraries will still have free access to it. I don't know. Uh, so that was more of the traditional way to get it. I ended up um, uh, coming out to Los Angeles and selling screenplays for his, which it, and then got an agent by writing spec screenplays. And then my agency also had a book department. And so at some point I was able to say, oh, could I talk to somebody in the book department about writing books? And uh, that's how I got my fantastic agent, Jennifer Joel, who uh, said to me, why don't you write middle grade? And I was like, oh, middle grade, okay. Middle <laughs> and, grade is fun. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. I was really thinking I was gonna write books. I thought like Belly Up was gonna be a, a, like an adult solving a crime, not a kid solving a crime. But the moment she said middle grade, it was like, oh, a kid could solve that mystery. And then that was it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, next one is, so now you guys are writing. Is there anything that helps you write better? One of them wants to know what's the best writing strategy. Oh, strategy. Uh, well, we <laughs> should start by saying that uh, all, there's no right or wrong strategy at all, right? That, that we can we can tell you what works for us, which uh, for me is yellow pads and outlines. Uh, so I, uh, I I do lots of notes, and this is like I, I start to formulate outlines before I write, uh, which uh, so I, I spend a lot of time. I can spend a year before I'm working on a book or more playing around with ideas until I'm ready. I've got that structure down to write, which helps me. I know, Sarah, do you outline? Yeah, I outline too. I'm a big believer in outlines and I spend most of the bulk of my work doing the outline first, figuring out all the details. And then I write a first draft. And when I write the first draft, I just go straight through. Like I don't look back, I don't edit. Often I'll change the outline. I won't stay to it exactly. But to me, I just don't worry about anything. I just want to get to the end because you can't edit a blank page. So you have to just write as much as possible. And then once I'm finished with the first draft, then I go back and edit and revise. And honestly, I reread and edit it about you know, 10 or so times. I also have a couple of readers, you know, friends who are readers who I'll send a section to or something and I'll get their comments and then I'll edit it again. So there's, lot, like, there's lots of steps. It's not just I write something out and I send it to my editor, right. usually. Yeah, I should say uh, uh, Sarah has read a book of mine before. Uh, oh. I, I, will, I will hold up, wait, here it is. Here's, here's Charlie Thorne in the last equation now, Sarah, ah. because I needed uh, I, this is my first female protagonist and I, uh, and it, from like at the center of the story and I really needed to know if she was working. So I asked yeah. Sarah if she could read. Uh, she, she's being a female and, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and so she, uh, she was very, very helpful. I actually came with some great help. On well, I think like one of the, I remember one of the things I was like, where's her hair? Is yes. it her as long as yeah. she to put it back? <laughs> you could not jump into all this stuff with your, I mean, I know from myself, my hair, you know, if I'm going on an adventure, I need some sort of elastic or scrunchie or something. <laughs> Things like yeah. that. <laughs> no, no, it was, it was this, I mean, it's a great piece of the book and it makes me seem like I'm really smart and know stuff about girls is, <laughs> is that, right, that Sarah came up with this idea that Charlie's hair needed to be flying in her face throughout the whole book. <laughs> and then at some point she gets a scrunchie and it's really uh, helpful. I'm glad. <laughs> Sometimes it takes help to be able to create something awesome. Yes. Okay, so the next one is they want to know just following this in a stream, it's kind of nice. They want to know how long does it take to actually write the book itself? So oh. you were talking about like getting into the process and then like from start to finish, how long is that? So when you sit down and start writing, it's maybe for me, three to six months to do the first draft. Uh, and then, uh, you're right, Sarah, you said about eight or 10 That's drafts or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So because some people do, again, this is not like there are people who do, 40 drafts, there are people who, who uh, you know, do this differently. But uh, so for me, right, then then doing those additional eight to 10 drafts, that's that's putting the book aside and, and coming back to it over and over. But that, that's like another year to get through all those drafts. 
Yeah, and that's why we work on so many things at the same time. People are always surprised at that, but because our books are always at different stages, um, then we that allows us to work on multiple projects. Like for right now, I just got the, um, or I'm getting like the, the copy edits back for Upside on Magic. So in the last few weeks, I've been working on another book and another project. So that's how we do, we write so many things. Gotcha. Okay, so a more specific question. Um, Sean Wallace wants to know, will Trixie become a spy? Yes. I want to oh, know that. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, um, are we allowed to ask this question? Well, you can ask that, but but I can't. That I have to say, that is classified. That is, that I, I'm not not going to reveal what is going to. Is she in the next happen. book, that's what I want to know. Is she is she a big part of the next book? Uh, uh, she plays a part in the next book. Like her her right. She she's a complication. Let's say in okay. the next. Book. Yeah. <laughs> that that was nicely said. <laughs> Okay, and then they want to know, what's another one? <laughs> Let's do that one. Oh, I like that one. Um, this one is from a teacher in a classroom and they want to know, how do you come up with the characters and their personalities? Oh, Sarah, do you wanna go first with, with the... I think they're all me a little bit. <laughs> I think, well, when I'm writing, I, I have to channel I, to kind of tap into a part of myself. That doesn't mean, you know, we all have so many different parts of our personality. So when I'm coming up with a character like Abby in whatever after I tap into, okay, her bossiness and she's, you know, the older sister and she has, you know, she's, she doesn't like change in certain ways. That doesn't mean that I'm always like that, but I, I try to really get into that. A lot of times the character will serve the plot or the big idea also for me. So I have to be like for, like for whatever after I knew it was gonna be about a girl who falls into stories. So then I'm like, okay, what kind of person is should best tell that story? And that will inform her character as well. I don't know if you do that too, Stu. Yeah, well, no, I think for your for your main character that their like their character is as much a part of the plot as the right. plot is, right? You have to say like, okay, I like yeah, for for spy school, it, it, like Ben had to be an outsider coming into this world and uh, why was he brought in and and what were Ben's strengths and you know could like I didn't want Ben to be like a person who could just you know, pick up a, a weapon and use it I wanted him to be like a normal person who really doesn't know how to use a weapon and and but it, but his strength had to be that he was really smart because that's a superpower that any of us can have really uh, but then when you get with with secondary characters a lot of the time they sort of come up because you like you need a certain type of person for the plot so erica comes out in spy school because i needed a best student at spy school and i thought well it'd be more interesting to make the best student a girl and then why would she be the best student well it, she would be the best student because her family is in the spy business and so uh so that's her you know i i'd never heard of a family there there are plenty of family businesses but i never heard of a family whose business was spying and then that creating that then creates her father and her mother and her grandfather and uh so those sorts of things happen whereas maybe at another point i would need a bad guy and i'd say well who would be a fun bad guy what would be a good riff on the bad guys from james bond movies well maybe it's the guy who's seen all the james bond movies and knows the mistakes that those bad guys made so he's not going to make them now <laughs> <laughs> that's great uh what about this one uh, alexa asks do you have a favorite scene that you've ever written for both of you Ooh. Ooh. um I, I would uh i think that sometimes you don't know that a scene is going like, like even with all the outlining you're 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 not quite sure about how a scene's going to work or whatever and so i remember writing belly up and suddenly having the idea for the for the funeral scene for henry the hippo <laughs> like i had not put that in the outline but suddenly i i had the vision of what this of this funeral going horribly wrong and how it would go horribly wrong and um and then saying like, okay, I have to now twist my plot and, and getting that scene and writing and thinking like, man, I'm really happy with that scene. Um, that's so funny, I'm trying to think. I feel like for me, my favorite scenes are, are, are usually in the whatever after books, like the moment where the characters mess up the fairy tale. Um, <laughs> I got the, my favorite line that I wrote, and it, it's related to a scene, is in the um, the uh, Rapunzel one when Abby Abby basically climbs up Rapunzel's hair, and they end up m m like messing up her hair. And then Abby looks at Rapunzel and says, "You know what would look great on you? 
bangs and starts like cutting her hair and you know that everything's going wrong. So it, to me, it's those moments that, that were really fun for me to write. <laughs> that sounds like a blast. This one is, oh man, it keeps disappearing. There it is. Okay. Um, this one is more specific for the spy series. So this one is from Chris and it says, I love how the Colorado flag is hidden within the ski slash boots on the cover for the spy school, um, hey. for the spy ski school. Do you have any other Easter eggs that are like hidden throughout everything? Um, wait, I should almost feel like I should show, wait, hold on. I'm gonna be right back. I'm gonna show what he's talking about here, um, <clears throat> which is that this is, this is uh, uh, right there where it, that's actually kind of looks like the Colorado flag with his skis and boots. And uh, I'm not going to say that uh, sometimes an Easter egg kind of happens, maybe by accident. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I did not, this, this is, all my covers are the, are the work of, of the incredibly talented Lucy Cummins. And I cannot necessarily speak to the fact that Lucy did this on purpose or not. Um, but uh, that said, uh, with, with all the dog of crossover and stuff, uh, um, I have started dropping Easter eggs into uh, the various books um, that might allude to other series. Uh, and, and I'm not even gonna say which series uh, are therefore connected or whatever, but, but there, there may be some Easter eggs now hidden in there. <laughs> May not have started on purpose, but it's going. <laughs> right, but, but but right. When I put them in, I know they're there on purpose. I'm not. I just can't. I cannot 100 say that that Lucy did this, but it, but it is. But if she did, it's brilliant. So I'll give her the credit for it. <laughs> Way to go, Lucy. <laughs> okay. Okay. The next one is from Kendi, and they want to know: Does writing energize you or exhaust you? <laughs> <laughs> I think Sarah's I, left there. That was like a, no one's ever asked me that before. <laughs> Maybe it's <cool. laughs> wow. I, I'll say this: it is it is great to be able to do this for a living, but um, it's it's kind of weird that after a really, I will be more tired after a long day of writing than I am after a long day of hiking, and uh, it it like sometimes a really long day of writing is very mentally demanding in a, in kind of a surprising way. Yeah, although I do find if I, it, it depends on which part of it. Like I had an idea last night, like in the middle of the night. And so I got up and tried to write it. And then this morning I was really, really energized by this idea. I like wrote a whole email to my agent about it and what it was. And I've still been on like a high from that all day. So it depends on the part of the process, but yes. I, yeah, I, yeah. I think like, getting excited about an idea is always a tremendous yeah. amount of fun. And, and sometimes writing a sequence is great fun, but yeah, I mean, let's point out, we're not, we are not coal miners here. We're right. not <laughs> doing the most physically. Demand. And I'm not saying this to disparage coal miners. I, I can't not believe what some people do for like, or firefighters, whatever. there's some really demanding jobs out there and writing is not the most demanding job, but, it can sometimes be using a standing desk or a sitting desk. Yeah, right. Yeah, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys so much for answering all those questions. And thank sure. you everyone for asking them. It was amazing hearing all your answers and that you guys went into such depth. That was a blast. So a couple of things to remember is that if you want to purchase any of the books, it's going to be in the chat down there. So you can always go there. Also, just throwing this out there, we do have book plates. So that's very exciting to Ooh. me. I'm yes. very excited about that. So another thing to know is that if you ever want to watch this again, we do have it over on our YouTube. And if you want to follow us for other events or anything else that's going on, it's going to be at Kids and Pros. So please do that. Last thing I want to do is ask both of you, what are you reading right now? All right. I, uh, I well, I mean, it's, it's, it's eerie that Gordon Corman came up because, <clears throat> because I just read War Stories by Gordon Corman, which is uh, a really, uh, I was really impressed by this book. Uh, and then I'm reading, um, I don't have it, I, I, uh, uh, All 13, which is Christina um, uh, uh retelling of, of, of the, um, of the, the Thai boys, uh, the, the wild boars in the, in, who got trapped in the cave in, in, uh, in Thailand, uh, which, uh, is is written for middle grade. It's a gorgeous book, and yeah. it is. Um, uh, it I, I actually did not. I, I knew far 
less of the story than I realized until I started reading this book. No, agreed. I started flipping through it and I learned oh my so much in two seconds. I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah, okay. yeah. What about you down there? Um, well, I just finished uh, Spy School Revolution today. So oh, that's a good one. <laughs> the next book I had is, uh, it's a great one. Highly recommend. <laughs> um, but the next book I'm going to read is uh, Rex oh. Free Lunch, which I've been meaning to read for a long time, and I'm doing an event with him next week. So I'm really excited to read it uh, and, to, and to get into it. And speaking of Christina, for those of you looking for books for, for younger people, uh, I, I loved Simon and the Art Museum, which I just read to my girls. Well, I'm a big Christina fan. I also have her, the, the, the All 13 also, which, I, which I'm excited to read too. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Thank you guys. So I think that's everything for today. If you have any last comments, let me know. Hold them for two seconds. We're good. Thank you so much for, well, for thank you. Us. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for having us. Okay. Guys, support politics and prose, please. It's such a great bookstore. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank sure. you. Thank you, Sarah, for joining me today. Oh, thank you for inviting yeah. me, Stu. Sure. <laughs>